say, okay, fine. That works. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Do we ping people? Oh, that's probably worth the money. Let me reply to your link. Uh, I feel bad tagging everyone. Should I just do here? Sure. Yeah. Here. Thought a slug had almost made it into the house. That would have been exciting. So, hello, 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 people. I don't know why I'm looking anymore. I've got camera here, camera here. I've got a screen over here. It seems high tech, but I have no idea how to make all of that stuff integrated in a way that's useful. Um, so, uh, do we have any like announcements or anything? Mike? Mike's quiet. Oh, I was yeah. muted that whole time. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> Go download the new firmware. Yeah, there's new firmware. Um, I'm using it, which uh, hopefully doesn't um, cause problems. Yeah, I, I didn't test that thing yet, but I think it's fine. Yeah. Uh, but I loaded it onto this Zoya before we went live, and I said, well, hopefully there's no, like, thing that makes it make the pitch detector explode or something like that. That would be bad for this particular thing. <laughs> um, yes, evil to me. That is the encoder fix. Uh, I guess... Should we call it a fix? Hmm? I guess it's a fix. <laughs> it's a change. Yeah, it, it goes faster. I, you know, like in certain ways, I, I, I because I get set in my ways, uh, I don't like it in some ways because you, you really do have to use, and maybe this is something where I should, you, you really do have to use the fine tune stuff for things that you didn't have to use before uh, with Zoya. So, you know, if you have, um, you know, I'll use a value module. Like this jumps values. I don't know if my screen's coming up at all. Uh, let me make that bigger. Make my screen, I'm gonna make this thing bigger, Mike. Huh? I'm gonna make the Zoya bigger. Yeah, that's fine. I, well, I thought that would have done it. Um, you know, this this jumps value increments a lot faster than it used to. Like yeah. Precision there. 
So for fine tuning stuff, you, you really do have to use, if you're not familiar with these methods, either holding down the encoder uh, or using shift in the encoder. Can you, I never actually checked this. Can you uh, pop in a de delay line real quick? I'm just curious what the, what the minimum increment is now. What, what it's probably still 1.3, but I'm just curious if the encoder speed affects that. Point zero two milliseconds. And then if you move it, like if you adjust it. Zero four, so on. What am I looking for here? Maybe I'm, maybe it's the wrong module. Sorry, there's like. Delay? Yeah, CV delay. I think the minimum is 1.33 milliseconds or something like that. Yeah, why would that change? Yeah. Um, right. That should still be the case, I think. Yeah, so you may you may have to use the find, like Christopher was saying, you may have to use the find, uh, the fine tuning thing a bit more often than you would have had to in the past. Depends on the application. This one works okay because the scaling for the CV delay is is uh, logarithmic. Logarithmic. Yeah. So it sort of depends on the module, but that was something that I was noticing. Um, you know, uh, that like it's generally a, a good fix, but but me being set in my ways and very used to like you know really precise uses of the the encoder, like you do lose a little precision. There's no way to please everyone in this regard. I think. Yeah, but um, it it's definitely faster. And it makes things a little easier. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, that's that's all the announcements I can think of. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just start off by saying, for whatever reason, I'm a little more anxious than usual with these things tonight. Uh, I don't know what that is, but I'm going to try to persevere. Is it the um, redistrict it? <laughs> The districts? It, no, it's not that. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I mean, I suffer from anxiety, as I'm sure some of the people watching this do and, and hopefully can appreciate. And, and just for whatever reason, there's some uh, confluence of neurochemistry and uh, events and whatever. I'm just feeling, uh, you know, wiry. Um, but maybe jumping into things will help that. So I, I was going to do the, my plan was to do the pitch track synth stuff for the first 40 minutes or so, and then turn it over to you and sort of come back, loop back at the end. Um, and I'll, I'll just be honest, I'm going to, I have an idea of how to proceed. Um, and it involves actually like skipping past the pitch track. My camera's weird. The pitch track, oh, I'm still weird, whatever. I'm, I'm gonna switch to camera, to paying attention to this camera. Um, and I've got a guitar that you can't hear right now. Um, good. I'm gonna move through the pitch track part pretty quickly and hopefully circle back to that uh, because I think the real place where a lot of nuance comes into uh, pitch track sense is in articulation um, rather than pitch tracking, which there are pretty finite things you can do with. There are a lot of options when it comes to how a note is articulated. So, you know, on the most basic level, I'm just going to put in an oscillator uh, and I'm going to use uh, square wave because it's pretty distinctive but not as abrasive as a sawtooth. So I'm just going to the audio uh, modules putting in a square wave oscillator and then you know the the part of pitch track since is in this section analysis modules um, which 
includes the onset detector, the envelope follower, and the pitch detector. And we're going to talk about all of these uh, tonight. So, um, you know, the, the pitch detector, I should say, I have an old video about pitch track sense. And part of the reason I wanted to do this live stream is to update that somewhat. And in that video, I talk about the pitch detector not being so great. And in a firmware update between then and now, uh, JP went in and, and really improved the performance of the pitch detector. Um, so, but I am going to talk about a couple of quick ways that you can improve its performance. Um, but I just want to look at the output for a second. If we uh, look at the output of the pitch detector, if I play a note, it responds by changing the, the pitch. And we can see that as a CV value. And I'm going to show that as a CV value because it's important, I think, to understand what the process here is. If I play high, we'll get a jump in the CV line. OK. What it's doing is taking pitch and translating it into CV or values that Zoya can recognize in its internal engine. Um, so it's not just identifying this as a, uh, a C sharp five. It's also translating that into a value inside Zoya that corresponds with a C sharp five for its internal oscillators. And I'm going to add some audio and I'm not, this is going to be like kind of obnoxious for a second. I'm just going to warn you. Was the obnoxious part just to make sure everyone's awake um and maybe i'll turn down the level on this patch a little bit before i make a connection like that again so basically what i was doing there was just trying to show that you know when i connect the pitch detector to the oscillator and play a different pitch uh we get a a, a change in cv that the oscillator recognizes um and there are a couple of ways we can improve the performance of the pitch detector. For one, uh, I put it in as a, a default connection at zero dB, uh, amplifying that up until, uh, let me see if I'm clipping now. You basically want as hot a signal as you can get going into this thing without clipping. Uh, because most pitch detectors work best at line levels. So it, it sort of depends on what the signal coming in is. But right now, I just have a guitar going directly into Zoya. And, you know, with a lot of pitch detection going straight in is, you know, you don't want to have like a bunch of stuff going on with your uh, input signal because that can confuse a pitch detector. So like if you have a you know, like a tremolo before the pitch detection, it, it can get confused as to what it's hearing and that sort of thing. You know, I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with this. On the other hand, if you have like a fuzz beforehand, that can sometimes uh, improve the performance of a pitch detector. But the reason that I'm, I'm mentioning this is because we want a hot signal going into the pitch detector. Uh, we can do a couple of other things. Um, one is to uh, add a compressor beforehand. And I'm not going to go into all of these in great detail, but Zoya has a compressor. You can add a compressor. Um, I do that sometimes. I don't do that sometimes. It sort of depends on what I'm looking for. The compressor will give a more consistent response. Um, but it'll affect dynamics, uh, you know, classic compressor trade-off, right? 
consistency versus dynamics. Uh, one that I do use a fair amount, though, is to throw a high pass filter on in between the input. I'm going to disconnect that input. I will throw a high pass filter on before the pitch detector. Uh, and I'll set that to about, it depends on what instrument I'm using, but about 80 hertz for a guitar, which is uh, toward the low end of the, I, I think an E2 is uh, 82 hertz. Um, and what I'm trying to do with that is uh, amplify the signal. What I'm trying to do with that is just cut out some of the low harmonics, um, particularly as a, a note like is held on the guitar string. I've noticed that um, as it starts to fade, some of the low harmonics will pick up. I, you can also put a, a low pass filter on um, and the low pass filter will cut out high harmonics, but most of the time with the guitar, and that may change depending on what instrument you're using, um, the high harmonics aren't really picked up. They're not louder than the fundamental. But the as a note fades, some of the low harmonics can overwhelm it, and you get that sort of like trailing fart sound is what I'm going to call it. Um, so... I'm going real fast, I feel like. Am I going real fast, Mike? Okay. Mike's giving me a no. No, I don't think so. Okay. But the basic idea is that the pitch detector detects pitch, which I, I, is going to sound weird coming out of it. It does sound weird coming out of it. Uh, but we can use that pitch to control an oscillator. Um, now, like I said, I'm going to move some of this stuff out of the way to give myself some more room. So again, my signal path right now is my input going to a pitch, to, uh, going to a, a filter. Um, and I'm using the multi-filter because I want less resonance. Uh, because, you know, the, the SV filter it has a fixed resonance of one. And the thing about that is if I'm playing like low notes, that'll actually accentuate um, some of that low harmonic content that I'm trying to avoid. Uh, so anyhow, it's going into a, a high pass filter, then into my pitch detector. I've amplified that connection and then that's going into an oscillator. And the next step is articulation. We got a question if you want to address it now. Suggestions for maximum accuracy with tracking. That goes with the filter and compressor, I think. You know, I mean, I, I think you have to play around with it. It's, it's sort of, you can add uh, filtering. I don't know, Brian, are you coming in just now by any chance? Because I kind of went over like some of this stuff uh, moments ago, like amplify the signal. Um, you can use a compressor. Uh, you can use filtering. I generally think a high pass filter is more effective at improving performance than a low pass filter. Um, and one other thing that I didn't mention, one other option, and I'll again turn on the the annoying oscillator when I do this, so you can add um, a quantizer in here. And a quantizer is useful depending on what you're trying to do, uh, particularly if you were, say, like creating a pitch track synth that played along with an internal synth, uh, 
you know, um, the, the quantizer, what it'll do is make sure everything is consistent uh, with Zoya's internal pitch scaling. So it'll make sure everything's quantized to a, a, a note. Rather than... I'm doing pitch bends right now. But you can't hear them because the quantizer quantizes everything to a, 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 an interval, which is sort of the disadvantage of the quantizer. Right, um, is it takes away articulation if you want to do vibrato or pitch bends or slides or you know that sort of thing. Uh, then the quantizer will make that impossible essentially. Um, but if you were, say, you had a sequence going in Zoya and you wanted to make sure that your, your pitch track synth, you were playing along with it. Uh, with your guitar or kalimba or bass or oboe or whatever, uh, that it was perfectly in tune with that sequence synth and Zoya, you could use a quantizer to get them on the same page about what pitch everything should be. Um, so, you know, the the... The pitch detection part, I think, is actually the really sort of like simple part of this equation, though. Um, I'm going to add first a VCA. We'll get into filters in just a second. So I'm going to add a VCA, and then I'm going to add another module. from the analysis modules. We're going to start with the most straightforward application, which is an envelope follower. Then I'm going to work up to some more um, esoteric, not esoteric, but complicated, complicated applications. So again, we can go through that high pass filter uh, to, to get to the output of our, or the input of our envelope follower, but we don't need to. Uh, because again, part of the reason we were using that was to eliminate low harmonics. What the envelope follower does is it reproduces the amplitude of your input. Um, and I'll just show that off right now. Why not? Uh, so if we look at it through the oscilloscope, if I play a note, we see this sort of descending staircase thing. If I... I don't know how good the resolution is there. Right? We're seeing it reproduce that input envelope. Now, I'm going to use that to hopefully control this VCA. Right? So that envelope is controlling the gain of the VCA, and we're getting, you know, a, uh, sorry, I bumped. We're getting a pitch tracked oscillator, right? Um, now, what we're hearing, if you listen to the trailing edge of this, how are my levels, by the way, on this? Maybe a smidge high, but pretty good. I can adjust that very easily due to the encoder fix. So the thing I, I want to point out about this configuration is it sounds, I don't, I don't know if it sounds 
like this to you, but it sounds ragged, right? There's a, a sort of, and that may be something you want, right? Start here. This is a very like unpolished response from the articulation. And we can do a couple of things to change that uh, just using the envelope follower. First, the envelope follower has a rise and fall time option. When we add those, what we're doing is, uh, I'm gonna put the guitar down for a second. We're adding a slew limiter um, to the envelope follower. And if this is sort of our, although it's real fuzzy down this, if this is our sort of guitar input, then what the slew limiter will do is sort of uh, cause this attack section to drag a little bit and smooth out some of the wiggles going down uh, the side. I actually have some loops prepared. Let's see if those work at all. Right, I used the right input for that. There was a reason I wanted to do that, and that was so we could look at the output of the envelope follower while something plays. As we increase the rise time on the envelope follower, uh, we'll see this, this sort of slewing occur. Um, so I'm going to play that same thing. There's more of a rounded edge to the envelope following. Um, so we can also increase the fall time, which will So, you know, that's a, a way of adding the, of changing the dynamics of the envelope follower. You keep pushing it. We're getting a sort of smoother envelope response and also a, a tone that is, you know, uh, more divorced from what the guitar is, um, you know, because we're, we're eliminating this sort of like percussive attack that is strongly associated with the guitar when we hear, you know, your twing uh, and then this sort of decaying envelope. Uh, this, this changes that shape. Um, which is, I think, part of the appeal of, uh, you know, doing guitar synths, right, is to, to change the dynamics and the performance of a guitar, um, you know, because I'll, I'll just tell you off the bat, like, I come from the bass world, and, like, if you play playing uh, electric bass, and if you really want, like, a quick and dirty guitar synth, tone, do what bassists do, which is run a fuzz into an auto walk, um, and you're there. You don't need to fuck around with any of these oscillators or anything like that. Like, but I think the, the difference there is that you're, you're not really changing the, the sort of performance of the instrument. So one option is to use uh, the, the rise and fall in the envelope follower, or the, yeah, the rise and fall in the envelope follower, which like I said, you could also use an external slew limiter. I haven't compared the two. There may be subtle differences in doing it that way as opposed to the other. Um, but in both cases, the outcome is gonna be a lot like this where you get changes in the, the I'm gonna just show it on the screen. <laughs> Right, we get this different performance from the 
uh, envelope follower. The other option that we can do with the envelope follower that is along the same lines but produces a slightly different effect is the CV filter. Um, I have like a whole video about the difference between the CV filter and the envelope or and the slew limiter. Um, the basic way I can explain it is uh, a uh, no. Well, I'm I'm looking at the questions now. No, it's it's this is how envelope following works everywhere. Um, it's not a limitation of the hardware. The problem with Zoya's, I'm sorry, the, I keep getting screwed. The problem with Zoya's uh, envelope follower, the problem is that it's actually fucking accurate. Whereas every other envelope follower you've ever used in any other piece of hardware has done all this slewing for you, okay? Um, what Zoya's envelope follower does is actually really capture the response, and then you have to figure out what the fuck to do with it. Um, but it's not a shortcoming. It's an opportunity. Uh, you know, this is the, the thing about Zoya is, it, it, you know, you, you, you get to figure out how to take these raw materials and, and work with them. So it's it's it has nothing to do with the hardware. This raggedy edge exists if you if you record a, a you know a guitar signal and look at it as it fades away. It has this I'm still fucked up. I, it has this sort of you know like quick and and then it it's not smooth going down. A guitar signal is full of oscillating frequencies and they interfere with one another and they create. Uh, this sort of response that you, this sort of, I was looking, uh, gesturing to my computer screen, this sort of response. Um, so, you know, that, that's a good question, but I, I, I think like the, the thing to keep in mind here is that, that this is, you know, like one of those like classic Zoya problems where it's not that Zoya does something poorly, it's that it does it so well and without as many safeguards as other things that you uh, like notice these things that you wouldn't notice in, in other pedals. So, you know, like if you look in the Mutron, the Mutron has some capacitators uh, that are hooked up to the input that, you know, like the size of the caps determines how much slew is applied to the input to create that um, Mutron envelope filter wah, sort of sound. Um, but Zoya doesn't have that. Uh, so, you know, and I'll, I'll, getting back to that, another way that we can emulate that sort of capacitator performance um, you know, is to use the CV filter. And I like the CV filter it's more aggressive than the slew limiter because it applies a constant uh, time uh, approach to its washing rather than a, a constant rate approach. This means it's a bit more aggressive. So the trade-off here is that the envelope follower will be much more, or the slew limiter slash envelope follower slewing will be much more responsive to your dynamics. Uh, the CV filter, you know, it's it's that classic. I mean, it, we already discussed it a bit with the compressor. Um, it's that trade-off between dynamics and consistency. have one that I or you've already heard lots of times. Uh, the envelope or the, the CV filter 
is going to be smoother than the SLU limiter, but again, at the expense of um, Let's try a different loop. I forget what I reported into this. Neato. Um, so the CV filter is an option. Uh, you know, again, you want to be judicious in how you apply these because if the CV filter is set too long, for instance, let's go back to our first. It just becomes sort of like mush, nothing happens. Um, but the CV filter is, is, you know, someone asked me if I was going to talk about uh, Velvet, which I released the other day. I use the CV filter in this to create the, the envelope for that patch because I wanted that more consistent, smoother response um, rather than the, the more dynamic response of the SLU limiter. So that's uh, the the two ways that you can really affect the envelope follower. Um, but you can also use the envelope follower to affect other things. So the, the other side of this section is where we get into um, ADSRs, right? So the advantage of the envelope follower, and you know, if you're slewing it, if you're CV filtering it, whatever, so that it's still pretty responsive to dynamics. Um, if you play quiet, the envelope follower will be smaller. If you play loud, it will be uh, larger, right? This, this wave will, will rise and fall in relation to what you play. If you, you know, cut off abruptly, it will respond to that. Um, the ADSR, the difference there is that you're going to get sort of a con consistent uh, shape each time, right? You know, that's the, the classic ADSR shape. And it's going to have this sort of smooth, well, it depends on what you set it to, but it's going to have this sort of smooth attack, decay, whatever those will be consistent. And this is part of the sound that we associate strongly, I think, with synthesize, synthesizers. Um, I'm going to see if I can change my settings here for a second. This will probably go poorly and is a bad idea. No, I don't see a way to do that. I don't think you can mirror it. Yeah. Or unmirror it. Unmirror it. So the, the ADSR is going to have a very synthy tone because again, we associate synthesizers with this sort of like mechanical response almost, right? You know, I mean, there, there are subtleties to it, but, but part of what makes a synthesizer a synthesizer is this ADSR response that we're so accustomed to hearing that is so different from the um, envelope of a acoustic instrument. Although it can be, well, Okay, I'm going to get into a digression there. So these two things are constantly like, up, you know, uh, asymptotically like approaching one another. And yes, like we can synthesize natural responses and make natural responses sound more synthetic. And uh, there's a dissertation in that somewhere, but I'm not going to write it tonight. The, the thing I wanted to talk about is the two different ways you can produce an ADSR using um, the, the Zoya features. So the first is we're going to keep our envelope follower. And what we're going to do is add a comparator. Now, 
the comparator is going to take that ragged ass uh, envelope follower and turn it into a simple yes or no uh, situation. Comparators, again, I've got comparators compare. Uh, just assume there's more information on comparators. If you want to learn about it elsewhere, what I'm going to use it for in this case is to set a threshold, right? Uh, and usually I set that threshold pretty darn low because really what I'm looking for the comparator to do is determine when I have silence and when I don't have silence. And when I have silence, it's going to produce a high signal. I'm going to play that spicy little uh note or uh, sequence we've been using. So it, it keeps hearing that is like one continuous stream of sound. We might be able to break that up if we increase the threshold. Yeah, we're getting little dropouts here. I don't know if you're seeing that. I'm going to, so we could just hook that up. get a gated response right uh, but it lacks that ability to, to add contour and, and whatnot so what we can do is connect the output of the comparator to an ADSR and I'm just going to have faith that the default ADSR kind of works for this application let's look at the ADSR so remember again our, our comparator is producing gates um, and we can look at the output of our ADSR We can change that response, add some more attack. Everyone loves attack. And I should point out that attack is really the name of the game when we're talking about guitar since the rest of the stuff doesn't really matter. Attack is the thing that takes us from that realm of, again, that percussive transient to that smoother pad sound. Um, you know, so if you want to make like a synth bass, you want no attack because you want that percussive sound. If you want to do something more spacey and ambient, you probably want a fair amount of attack. So, and, you know, we can change the ADSR settings. The, the thing to keep in mind about this is, again, if we take this uh, threshold lower, and play it. This ADSR doesn't close, right? Between notes. The, you know, the, the, um, the amplitude of the, the envelope follower doesn't drop low enough for the comparator to drop low. And so it just sees the ADSR just receives a constant gate from the comparator. So it does really matter, um, you know, how you set this, this threshold. If you set the threshold too high, let's see if I can come up with something that works for that. Doesn't trigger at all. Uh, this is not a particularly dynamic sample. Right? did that on purpose because I wanted something that would be really consistent through all the examples. But if I see if I have anything more. Right. So this is a good one because this uh, sample that I'm using has some slides and that sort of thing uh, and some softer notes. And they're not all being picked up. If we look at the output of our uh, envelope follower, there's 
stuff that's falling below the level, of, like that last note that played wasn't picked up by the comparator because the, the threshold was set too high. Um, so, so the, the advantage here is that the, you know, it can give you that more synthy response and it can also, this will be important in a second when I talk about the onset detector, it can last as long as your note is playing, right? You know, your input matters here. I'm gonna switch back to my guitar. If I play a long note, the ADSR responds to that. If I just play a short note, the ADSR responds to that. Um, the, the thing that most people dislike about this particular approach is that um, if I play like a run, uh, the ADSR doesn't drop back, like it doesn't re-trigger the envelope because the envelope is really only re-triggered when we drop below that threshold. Um, so we're going to get away from the envelope follower for the first time. Uh, that's the, the way to, to create a gate that you can use with an ADSR. Uh, what I'm going to show now is how to use a trigger with an ADSR. And I'm going to talk for a second about ADSRs. There's an important um, control in ADSRs that is worth a whole video on its own, uh, which is immediate release. I don't know why I'm writing this now, because I'm saying it, but I want it to sort of sear in your head. This is probably the most important control on an ADSR module because it affects how it responds um, to the input. So if you are using, fuck, I'm gonna, sorry for the swearing. Uh, this stuff is all a spicy meatball uh, to quote Rob. But if you are uh, trying to trigger an envelope rather than gate an envelope, and what I mean by that is a gated envelope is one where the sustain level will stay high until that envelope, until that gate is released, and then it'll drop into its release stage. Uh, so, you know, that would be a high signal. Think of like a, when you're pressing down on a keyboard, a keyboard produces a gate, and that gate is held open until you release the key. Um, but there are also triggered envelopes, and triggered envelopes are ones that just receive something at the beginning, and then the envelope goes through its cycle until it concludes. Um, so they are not as responsive to duration, right? You know, when you press the key, uh, the, you know, in most keyboard systems, and this changes somewhat, when you press the key, the, the note plays and it stops when you stop playing. Uh, a triggered envelope, if you press the key, the note would start playing, but it would end playing whenever that envelope finished its cycle, not when you release the key or not. Okay, and this is useful because we can use triggers uh, uh, to control envelopes. And what we lose in duration, we can make up for in sort of percussive advantages using the onset detector. So the onset detector is looking for transients. Uh, in your your um, notes, it's trying to find the beginning, that that percussive attack, right? Like the beginning part. And when it does, when it thinks it's doing that right, uh, it 
produces a trigger. Let's see if we can get it to trigger. Do I have this? I'm going to change the output. It should trigger with that. Let's see if we can get it to trigger this ADSR. Nope, I don't know what's going on here. Ah. Are you sure you connected to the input? Yeah, there we go. I connected it to, I'm using both inputs, and I only connected it to one input. Got it. So, yeah. Now, the, the other thing I'm going to do to this is add a re-trigger input in. Uh, and, and the advantage of a retrigger input is that oh, there's so much to say about ADSRs. The advantage of a retrigger input is that, um, well, it'll affect how percussive this envelope sounds. So I'm going to take the attack down. And connect it to both the, the uh, gate input and the re-trigger input. And, and basically what's happening here is that when it receives a new trigger, uh, the envelope will start over again. And this is really advantageous uh, for getting a percussive response that will begin at each cycle, uh, or at each note, hopefully. But we need to tune the sensitivity. Um, the detector has a sensitivity control. And again, we're in this, this realm of like, trying to imperfectly, you know, have hardware that knows what we want out of it, right? And some of this depends on plane dynamics and what goes into the onset detector. This is another module that I would say, unlike the envelope follower, might benefit from having um, a compressor placed before it. Or if you wanted more control over sensitivity and you thought you got a better response from a gate module, that would be an option as well. Um, but I like the the onset detector because if I'm playing a run of notes change that attack if I get the sensitivity right it'll recognize unlike the the envelope follower gate, it'll recognize each of those as distinct notes. Whereas the, the envelope follower gate, uh, what we would hear there, if, if I switch back to it, would just be that initial sort of attack and then sort of even level on the, the VCA. Um, and so those are, there are some other methods. Um, to use, but those are sort of the, the major ones for articulation. Uh, I'll, you know, like there is a way that you can produce a trigger if a note changes or, or a pitch changes. I've done that on, on one pitch track synth. Um, you can combine uh, the gate method with the onset detector method, which I think is pretty effective. Uh, by having what I do when I do this is have the onset detector essentially uh, send an inverted signal to wherever the, the gate is going and it interrupts that gate, right? So you get a little bit of the best of both worlds in that one because it's responsive to duration, um, but it also can recognize new onsets, but it's really CPU intensive, which is something I didn't talk about. Uh, 
the onset detector is one of the most expensive modules in Zoya. Uh, so I like its performance, um, but it's often one that, that I leave aside because there are other things that are more important to me. And all of these, you know, that's a classic Zoya conundrum, right? Is that you have different options uh, that, you know, will uh, be things that you have to balance in a patch. Um, so pitch detection is not cheap, but it's not like ludicrously expensive. Envelope following is pretty cheap. Onset detecting is, again, like one of these, like you put it in and you're like, right, that's where a bunch of my budget is going. Um, and I have a couple of things to talk about, but I don't want to, I want to make sure we get to abyss water and also I, I need a break. I don't know if you can hear that in my voice. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Mike uh, to talk for a while. If you have questions about this stuff, I, I hope we have time to circle back at the end and I can talk about, like, obviously this is not what most people think of when they think of, like, a guitar synth. This cool, awesome sound that I've um, and, and we can talk about filtering, which is a big part of this, uh, and, and Mike ha might have some things to say about filtering too. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to let Mike talk. You, are you good for that, Mike? Can you talk for a little while? Yeah, I'm, I'm game. Let's do it. All right. Um, give me like a minute though, just to get set up. With our highly professional organization like this, I don't know. We're running a tight ship. So about West Virginia redistricting. Yeah, Rob, Rob's on top of it. The Senate passed their map today, uh, or yesterday, I guess. Um, so I have no idea what Senate district I live in anymore, because why would my Senate district have anything to do with the county that I live in? That wouldn't make any sense at all, my goodness. Uh, I can fill on this for a while, Mike, but please interrupt me when you're ready um, because the WV or WV politics is uh, a little, a little, you know, local. I understand we're important to the rest of the world, um, but you know the the you know. Sorry, I just talked for an hour. My mind is kind of blank. Yeah, okay. Well, keep that in mind, Rob, and we can talk about it at the end. Um, Mike's getting close to being ready. Getting there. Kind of there. The whole process. Yeah. Okay. So if I have time, I will do some um, audio. But for now, I have visual aids. Um, trying to organize everything on my desk. You can just make sweet, sweet sounds. You need some audio. OK. 
Okay, we have visual aids. Okay, I will cycle between the Zoya and the iPad because that's how this is gonna work. All right, so let's talk about abyss water. And we'll start with uh, what is provided to us from the lovely Fairfield circuitry people. So um, if you look at the, this is the diagram that's that they have included in the shallow water manual, um, along with a bunch of very important information um, if you're curious on how to make this pedal. Um, this is the block diagram. It may be simplified in some areas, but basically it, it follows this um, this pathing. Uh, the main things to note is that the delay line is a BBD. Um, I don't know which one exactly. It might be a X5 one. I'm not exactly sure, but it uses a BBD uh, for the delay. So technically, this is an analog um, pedal um, with a pretty unique function. Um, the the main two things that it does is um, random vibrato uh, for your sort of classic vibrato sounds that are kind of pitch warped and not cyclical, uh, as well as a low pass gate um, filtering scheme, which is a unique kind of filter. Um, um, and from what I understand, it uses Vactrols and some fancy envelopes and very specific things to get the response just right, because it's actually combining a filter with a VCA uh, sort of in the same system. Um, uh, and then there's, um, there's a mix control, there's uh, a slewing control, a damping control for the actual LFO going into the delay line. Um, and it's a whole bunch of stuff. So the important thing to know here is there's basically three components that I want to talk about. One is the audio path. Two is the filter or low pass gate. And three is the modulation on the delay line. So the audio path is pretty straightforward. Um, and it's pretty easy to replicate on Zoya. And I've listed it out here. Uh, if you can read my, my chicken scratch. Um, the audio path is very simple in Abyss Water. It is uh, a stereo in, two Haas uh, delay lines. Um, I, I will make a note that I ended up, I had a linear control delay line in here in the first iteration of this patch, but I didn't like it as much as the, the Haas stereo spread. Um, and Christopher might be able to explain why. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but I preferred the Haas, uh, maybe because the it had a smaller range of delay. They have so, slightly different interpolations. Yeah. Um, so they respond differently. Both of them are linearly controlled, but there's still, uh, in order for any linear delay to know what the fuck to do when it gets a signal that tells it to jump from 10 milliseconds to seven milliseconds, like there are different schemas for what to do with the um, samples that are in its buffer. And I don't know exactly what the differences are, but I hear them there is a smidge of a difference with how those two respond. And okay. there are, I agree with you, there are applications where I like the Haas better than the, the uh, linear delay. Yep. Thank you. Yep, basically. Um, so I, I opted for the, the stereo spread on Haas, which is probably my most used module. It's just a really, I mean, especially before we had the linear delay line option, it's just a very flexible way to add in vibrato or chorusing to your to your patch in a, in a cheap, you know, method um, in terms of CPU. Uh, after that, we have, uh, so this is a stereo routing. So that's one of the benefits of this patch. It's, it's a, basically a stereo clone of the shallow water. Um, um, so what I, when I say two times low pass filter, that means it's, two for each side. So it's actually a, um, a 12 dB per octave uh, low pass filter with the multi filter. Um, and again, I chose the multi filter because it has 
the, you're able to go to no residents. Uh, the shallow water is very much non-resident. Um, it has maybe a, a hint of a peak um, at a particular um, uh, toggle in the low pass gate control, but otherwise it's very flat in its response. Um, so I wanted to mimic that. So I set it so that it would be very non-resident. But then I realized while building the patch that it would help to have a little bit of resonance in the filter sweep action uh, for how the envelope follower affects it. And so it it goes, it, I added a resonance control basically um, to that, uh, those two sets of 12 dB uh, multi-filters. Then it hits an audio balance uh, because remember it needs the, um, needs the clean signal to do chorusing. So that's coming in from the input. Uh, and then the additional controls here, which are not something that you can tweak on the shallow water, but something that I think is inherent in the actual pedal, um, is a compressor and an overdrive, right? There's a sort of subtle sort of saturation effect um, that the volume control at paired with the low pass gate provides to the pedal. So it, it kind of doubles as this saturator. So I wanted to mimic that. Um, so again, I have two, co two compressors set. I don't remember what they're set up, but I can take a look. Um, pretty mildly. So the settings I have, um, let's see, minus 35 uh, dB on the threshold. Uh, I've got the patch open if you ever want me to, to refer to something while you're going over. Just, sorry, I'm putting No, that's up. okay. That's fine. Uh, pretty fast attack, um, slow to slow release, uh, three to one ratio. Yeah, so it's a moderately uh, placed compressor, and then it has two uh, pushed overdrives, which is probably my favorite overdrive that the Zoya offers. Um, I like all of them, but really the pushed is is where I get the most use, and it's used in uh, glamour years, pretty years, very extensively. Um, but basically, the push is like this saturator. Essentially, is how I how I use it uh, with a plus three and minus four uh, input output gain. And there's two of those, right? One for each side of the uh, of the stereo spread. All right. So that's the audio routing. It's it's pretty straightforward. Um, one thing that I will note uh, about the the audio routing on how it have it set up. Um, a lot of the the minor details on getting things right in terms of responses and getting things right in terms of values comes from, you know, tinkering. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what's a good setting for the initial filter, what's a good setting for the initial resonance, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, so I tried to build that in with, into the patch, but then I decided it might be nice to include some extra controls, um, such as the frequency bias which is an option provided within the pedal. Uh, so you have to open it up and you can adjust the low point of the filter frequency, All right? So this will set your, your bottom frequency for where it's going upward from. Um, and that's exactly how I did it. There's, there's a bias on the control panel, which sets the low point of the low pass filters, right? So here I have it set all the way up to 810, which is, you know, hundred percent. And that's hitting, uh, about 157 hertz. So that's uh, the low point that I have uh, when, when it's set all the way to you know that maximum bias point. I think the bias point maximum on the pedal is around 200. It might be like 170, 180. Um, so that can be adjusted if, if you want to get it as close as possible. But 157 worked for me. Um, uh, let's see what else. Right, there's a resonance control that controls uh, how resonant each of these filters get. Um, something that uh, I'm working on, it's very easy to make the change yourself if you're curious, is instead of using low pass filters here, you can try using band pass and increasing the resonance and you'll get more of a pinged sort of filtery sound. It won't sound like the shallow water, but it'll sound like something else. It might be a, something unique to try. Uh, let's see. All right, so we talked about the audio path. We talked about some of the, the additions that I made. Um, let's talk about the CV, the thing that really sort of sets this apart. Um, <clears throat> so we'll talk about the, so I have the filter. 
because that's we you know we, we discuss some envelope following um, some ideas between the CV filter. Uh, basically, the idea is we want to use the attack of our guitar signal or synthesizer or whatever to determine how much the filter opens. Right, an idea that's very common in synthesis. You have this filter envelope, and you set it to some degree, and you have some contour controlling that amount going into the filter. Right, because if it's starting at 157 or whatever, whatever low point of your filter, it's going to sound very dull, right, when you have it at 100% wet. So you need some sort of filter action to open up the envelope, uh, to open it up. Uh, so for this, it's using a basic envelope follower. We just Christopher talked about that. All right, so everything for the a CV lives on this uh, second page. It's got a bunch of blinking lights. Um, so we've got, uh, what's interesting about this is that I opted for a couple stages of slewing, I guess you can call it. So in my diagram below, I, I write envelope follower, goes into a CV filter, goes into a multiplier, which has the low pass gate uh, control, which goes into the filter cutoff, right? That's the basic routing for the, the filter opening and closing with your notes. Uh, so for this envelope follower, I have it set pretty, uh, it's, it's sort of like the opposite. It's got a, a long attack and a very short decay, right? So 200 milliseconds of attack, very short decay, five milliseconds. And then I take that sort of like, you know, I can't remember, it's like, you know, long attack basically kind of looks like a weird shark fin thing. Uh, so if I take that out and I send it to another slewing factor, it'll sort of amplify the envelope uh, and sort of sh shape it even weirder. Uh, so then I send it into the CV filter uh, with a very, very abrupt attack and a um, moderately rated um, decay. Right, so that's going to take that sort of shark tooth and just add a hint of a snappy response to it uh, with that with that last aspect. Um, and this was really sort of the secret for how I was able, to me at least, um, and I'm biased, but uh, um, this sort of setup is, is why it sounds very similar to what I heard when I was playing with the actual shallow water pedal. It just has the right response on the filter uh, combined with the control that you're setting on the low pass gate, it, it just works really, really well. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the guts of it. It's, it's just two modules that we talked about. Like Christopher talked about, it's, it has a lot to do with how you're slewing the signal, how contours are sort of shaped over time. Um, so that's how I uh, went about it. And then it's hitting the multiplier, and that this is set by the front panel control. And then this is hitting uh, all four filters and open, opening them up at the same time. Right, so that's the filter, right? We talked about this, basically this system right here. Now let's talk about this stuff. All right, so in the shallow water, there's two degrees of randomness that are happening. One is on the, um, the rate of the delay changes. And the second is on um, how much that is actually affecting the delay line. All right, so on this second page, again, this is where all the CV lives. We have our main LFO, LFO clock source, right? So this is what's driving the, the modulation in the pedal. Um, and it's we have a rate control on the front page. Uh, to determine that, um, Eventually, I'll add a tap tempo to this, but I didn't really think tap tempo was super necessary because it's not something you can like cyclically hear with a random output. It's just kind of a thing that that happens, um, you know, randomly. Um, so then that then that LFO is hitting. I'll try to open this up. Um, it's hitting a couple. It's hitting two things actually. It's hitting a clocked random, right? This is a random module, not a random LFO. This is a random module with the trigger on and that's right here so we have this trigger in so it's generating a new random signal every time the lfo goes high right just random dispersion of notes or cv and it's also hitting the 
input of a CV delay, right? So though it's sending a pulse to a CV delay signal, and then that CV delay is getting modulated by the random module right below it. So it's basically offsetting how long it takes for the clock pulse to exit the CV delay based on some random factor, right? And this random factor is diminished by uh, one fourth, right? So it's taking every fourth of the, the random output and setting that to the delay because I didn't want them to be too large of gaps between the clock signals or the, the, or the tap signals, right? So it's bidding out a trigger at some, you can see it kind of that there's these gaps that sort of appear slightly longer than others and slightly shorter than the other ones. Um, you're just sort of spacing out that, um, that LFO so it's less uh, constant. Right, because the square of LFO is very good at happening at the same time every single uh, cycle. Right, so it's just making it slightly humanized or unquantized, if you will. Then the output of that CV delay is going into another random module. And this is what's generating the slewed CV that's going to go into the, um, the delay line. Right, so we have this going into, right, and this random, right, it's it's still a random source. It's just the pulses are not exactly in sync with the LFO time. It's slightly longer, slightly shorter. Um, it's, it's slightly randomized, basically, is, is the idea. So then that hits another CV filter. This one I have set uh, where it's only having no single control. There's no, it's, it's a linked control. Um, and basically what this is, this is timed, uh, this is set up with the damp control on the, on the pedal on the front page. So the damp is basically setting a slewing amount um, that that CV at the input, right, this random step that's slightly out of time with the LFO and slewing it by some amount so that way it becomes a smoother, smoothish. Uh, CV that's going to eventually go into the delay line for that vibrato. Um, so if I if I remember correctly, the minimum here is 175. I, I thought it was around 100. That yeah, that's about right. Um, so I didn't want it too slow, too fast. So it, it's got you know some aspect where it's it's going to create um, smoothness out of that random source. Then that hits into a multiplier. This multiplier is the depth control on the front page. That's going to determine how strong the signal is going into the delay line. So at the end of the day, what's happening is the delay line is increasing by these random peaks um, that's attributed to two sources of randomness, right? It's the randomness coming from the actual random module that's triggering the CV filter as well as the how often those um, pulses happen uh, is slightly randomized. And that's basically it. Um, um, some things that I find unique about this approach, uh, basically these two edit controls, um, the frequency bias is, is a nice way to sort of uh, soften up your signal more or boost it slightly uh, because this again sets the minimum frequency for those filters and the low pass gate is setting how much of the envelope from the input is increasing the filter um, right so if you do freak bias all the way up and then low pass gate all the way up it's going to be pretty bright all the time because it's going to be you know starting from the highest point that I, you can set it at and then opening up 100% from your envelope, right? So if you diminish that to about half and keep the frequency bias at full, then this is the probably the optimal response that I, that I, that I found. And then if you bump up the resonance a little bit, it'll just give it a little more uh, beef to sort of the, the filtering and it, it sound nice. Uh, and then lastly, something I really, really like to do is turn down the mix uh, to like a nine so just a smidge of a clean signal 
um, right? This is setting the audio balance mix control. Uh, so you're blending in the, the dry signal. Um, and then if you bump the volume, it's just going to add a little more of that saturation coming from the overdrive and, and the compression. Um, as far as the three modulation controls are concerned, you can basically set them any way you want. Um, the interesting thing about the pedal is that it's very touch sensitive on the depth control. It really doesn't start kicking in until about halfway through its, you know, its travel. So I tried to, I tried to mimic that, but then I realized I that's not something that I liked about the pedal. So I tried to change it so that it would have more of effect earlier in the, um, the travel. Uh, and then the damp, uh, the damp is really the one that has the most effect on the, the modulation because it's setting that CV filter. Right, so if you keep it all the way down, the CV filter is going to be, you know, it's going to be jumpy. It's not going to be as smooth as it could be. But if you turn it up, let's say like a seven ish, then it's going to be pretty smooth. Right, there's some peaks in there, there's some jitteriness, but for the most part, it's it's a this weird sort of triangle wave that's sort of traveling up and down. Uh, but if you go all the way up, then it's gonna take a long time for those randomness, those random effects to have you know, any change on your modulation. Uh, so there's something to keep in mind. Um, other things I can talk about, let's see. Uh, last thing, I added a optional and this is something that I added on the, the Zebu version of the, the, this patch. I added a noise uh, source uh, plus a VCA. Uh, this VCA will open from the same envelope that opens the filter. Uh, and then if you input the noise into the filter input, it'll introduce some noise uh, into the signal chain if you like that. Uh, but since the pedal version didn't have any noise, I didn't add it here on the Zoya version yet. Uh, but I can easily do that. So yeah, that's abyss water. Let's see, questions. Yeah, stereo spread module. Um, so stereo spread, I'll just make it very apparent here. So if you go to the uh, stereo spread, there's an option called method. And you want the Haas two A's, just like the avocado. And the other option is mid side, um, but Haas is the the one you want for for uh, linear control delay lines that have this interesting response. Yes, thank you. I, I do believe that the resonance control added a lot here. It it didn't have the same effect if I didn't add some resonance to it. Uh, let's see what else. Um, yeah, the original definitely is, um, it definitely has a lot of filtering on that low pass gate. I, I think it's sometimes too smooth. Um, and I, it, I, I, it, it could be a good thing because uh, the pedal is, is very much something that you just naturally can play, you know, for a while and, and not really sort of like notice it. I think that's why it has that sort of subtle, um, the shallow water is probably the, the pedal that gets referred to as the subtle pedal because it's like, oh, is it even doing anything? <laughs> um, but yeah, you have to sort of mess around with, I, I would mess around if you're using the pedal version and not the Zoya version. Um, mess around with the internal bias on the inside of the, the circuit and that can maybe change some of the response on the low pass gate. Um, but I like having it here for easy access. And Can I will. Another place where I mess around with it. Yeah, sure. So, one of the things everyone should keep in mind about my patches is that I don't play with a pick. I play only with fingers, and I have a pretty soft touch. So, um, even if I like max out the L the LPG and the the bias, it's still pretty like. <laughs> me so i i sometimes mod do you want to switch the the view 
I can. Sorry. Uh, so I have a this water open on my Zoya here. I'm, I'm on that CV page. And, and all that I'm going to do here, and this is something that I do with a lot of my patches that have an envelope follower and response, is uh, where there's a depth control, I'll increase that amount, that connection you know, between the end of the slewing and this uh, multiplier that controls, that, that's linked to the L, LPG control. Uh, and for me, you know, that gives me like more options for the, the range of the, the tone of the, the patch. Um, you know, and, and if I just leave it in the default condition uh, I'm I'm pretty in the mud, uh, just based on like how hard I play a guitar in any given certain like there is a dynamic response, but like if I just sort of stroke, this would all be much. I'll return it to a hundred percent again. This would all be like that's okay, but I want a little bit more range um yeah definitely as yeah I, I think on one of the earlier builds i had it at it was always 150 percent between those two so it would it give you slightly more than the low pass gate setting that you had on the, the multiplier yeah that's a good point and I, I think that's when i realized that i needed to add resonance because before i just was i was leaving it at you know the, the minimum resonance and it was very muddy and, and sort of just like okay what's happening here so then I bumped the resonance, and then I felt because I use a pick and I play pretty hard on my guitars, I didn't need the that hundred fifty percent connection as much. Yeah, but, but I think that's something important to keep in mind with this discussion of analysis modules too. Is right like uh, for all of you know we, we've talked about the onset detector and its sensitivity uh, and the the envelope follower, all of these things because they're dynamic modules your dynamics affect them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so what works well for one player or what settings work well for one player may need some slight tweaking. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind if you're, if you're downloading someone else's patches and you either they identify or you recognize that they're using some of these modules is like a place where you may need to go in and adjust a threshold or, or change a, a connection strength or something like that to get the response you want. Cool. Yeah. No, um, I'm, I'm happy to have provide some, some intel onto this patch. Um, I think it's, you know, like I said, I, I hadn't, I hadn't had a chance to actually make a video comparing the two directly, but while I was tinkering around, I, I felt that it was, um, I'll say close enough <laughs> for my needs to let me not have to buy another shallow water for the third time. Do you still have a shallow water? I don't. I was borrowing a, a, a JAB's at that time. Mm -hmm. I'm energy for a random Zoya question. Oh boy, how random are we talking? <laughs> yeah, go for it. And then I want to circle back to some of the the pitch track stuff. Yeah. Do a hard. I I think I need more context for that. What what is a hard instant reset of delay or looper module? Like to make them stop repeating. There's a reset on the looper if you turn on overdubbing, and then there's a reset gate input or push button. Anything, it, trigger will do it. Trigger will do it, yeah. Uh, but for delays, but you can set you can um, you can like oh resetting the buffer generation. Uh, So, you know, you've got a delay 
and then it's recycling back into itself. Um, if you're using a VCA here, and I recommend you do because it gives you a lot more control, you can send a signal with, you know, negative CV. How far off my, let's see my weird drawings. You can send negative CV, uh, it's still off the tape, negative CV to the VCA, and that will, you know, like um, clear out the regeneration loop. Uh, clearing out a delay mid, like what's going in the input and coming out the output isn't really possible. You can like mess up the time and that'll mess up what's going through there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much all I can think of too. If, you, if it's on a feedback loop, you can mute the loop, but that first delay repeat is always going to go through. Yeah, I have, uh, in, if you go on tips and tricks, evil Timmy, should we be helping the forces of evil? <laughs> evil Timmy, uh, if, if you go on tips and tricks, I have a schema for uh, like a held buffer delay, like a did, 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 that you can open and close, um, which is just, you know, I mean, what it does is it, uh, Imagine a VCA at the entrance of this little delay uh, scheme, and it, it basically what it does is it switches between the VCA and the regeneration loop or the VCA at the input of the delay line being open. Um, that's all that it, it does. Uh, you could do that with an audio switch, but for whatever reason, I use two VCAs. Because uh, <laughs> that's just, um, but, you know, like, then, then you can have that like capturing of the stutter sound and then emptying out as soon as, as it's released. Uh, there's no magic. I still don't, I'm not quite sure what a magic reset is. Uh, so may, maybe, but I need to know more. I need to have more context to understand what, what you're after. And I think the place to express that context is maybe a post on Arzoya where you can write out everything rather than us trying to process this in real time and go back and forth. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see, were there other questions? Yeah, I don't think that. I yeah. Yeah. Just post it there. We can we can articulate it a little better uh, with some more context. All sorts of stuff. And, and again, because I'm ha I'm telling you right now, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding what you're after. Try to explicate, um, give examples, and that sort of thing. Uh, like because reset clearly means something specific to you, but I can interpret it in a bunch of different ways. Um, and that's the limitation of language. Uh, well, sorry, my brain is just maybe connecting. I, I will just I'll say one more thing and then we can move on. Yeah. Um, I think the difference here is the delay line doesn't have any memory. It doesn't have a buffer that you can clear, right? The delay line just takes the audio at one point, delays it by some amount and spits it back out at the output. Right. There's no function to clear the buffer while it's running. There's no function to, right. The only way you can do it is if you sweep the delay line um, amount to zero, and then it'll, you know, do that weird, you know, the uh, the pitch shifting thing, um, yeah, rubber decking. Off, there's still weird artifacts. But right. Um, but because there's no discrete buffer that you can clear like you would on a granular module, or a looper module, or a, something like a, a pedal that has that uses a buffer for its its looping. Those are things you can directly clear, right? And, yeah, and the feedback solution is what Christopher just mentioned. If you have a uh, if you're trying to clear out feedback from running too long, just use a VCA and diminish that to zero, and then you're good. Uh, it's basically, you know, the 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 VCA is like a door. And you're just slamming the door shut in turn in 
that regeneration loop, right? Like the door can be opened all the way and you get regeneration at 100% or you can be cracked and you get you know, regeneration that causes the, loop, the echoes to diminish. Or you can just... Um, cool. Yeah. All right. Christopher, you wanted to finish up because I'm I'm starting to lose steam myself. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just wanted to so you know the, the stuff I was doing earlier was like sort of theory, right? Like foundational. And the examples were not um, like particularly concrete. Like no one really wants the 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 sound that I was making earlier, right? Like they want a more elaborate sound. They want, you know, um, they want cool stuff instead of, you know, there might be someone going, that's my jam, but I think. So I was just going to talk a little bit about this patch, which I released the other day that, that that's complete and some of the decisions that I made about it to sh put this stuff into context. Um, so this is just the control page, all of these controls, like in the, I'm going to, I'm going to change the screens around. All the controls, like in Mike's patch, connect to, to things interior to the, the pedal. I'm going to move past those real quickly. Um, and I put the effects, which are the least interesting part of this, uh, at the, the second page, just because if you wanted to go in and fuck around with them, you could. Uh, so I've got an audio input and the audio input goes into a compressor. And I talked about this before, right? Like the trade-off between compressors and non-compressed signals is dynamics versus consistency. Um, so this is a, a pretty like mild compressor, um, but it is something that gives a slightly more consistent response. And, you know, it's it's like Mike was talking about in the, the you know, like the fine tuning of randomness in Abyss Water, right? Like, um, the compressor doesn't make a huge difference in this patch. It's not like light on, light off, uh, but these little things have cumulative effects and nuance is really where like a patch can come alive. Um, so it goes into a compressor, then into a multi-filter. This is a uh, high-pass filter like I talked about and I've set it to 82 Hertz. And then that goes into our pitch detector uh, and the pitch detector goes into uh, a CV filter. This is for the portamento effect. So I'm gonna go back to the... And one thing I didn't mention is that a little bit of slewing or filtering after the uh, pitch detector output, even if like you, you might not hear it as like... like Right here, we're hearing, I'm not playing with a lot of technique, but <laughs> um, I'm just trying to get sounds out. Uh, but like, <laughs> if we push this, we get like more glide and it sounds a little kooky. <laughs> which again, maybe not everyone is into. I'm, I'm not really into that sound all the time, but a little bit of, of CV filtering, uh, because again, like I talked about it being something that can be used to sort of smooth out a signal, um, a little bit of CV filtering after pitch detection can actually, you, you wouldn't really hear it as like portamento or glide or whatever, you just hear it as like smoothing out some of the indecision of the pitch detector as you move from one pitch to another. Um, 
So that's the, the pitch detection. And then that goes into three oscillators, three triangle wave oscillators. And I triangle wave oscillators are my new jam. I've been using them a lot on patches. And what I like about them is that as you change their duty cycle, you get really different uh, timbres. So the timbre control here controls the duty cycle of those oscillators. And it's attenuated uh, to a little bit below 50%. Um, so that it sweeps from a 50% duty cycle to a, like 99.991. If you go all the way to 100, it goes back to the uh, unaffected sound. But at the, the edges, the real light, and as you back that off, you get a response that's um, kind of sawtooth-ish. But it's a good oscillator to use because you can go all the way back to a 50% duty cycle and get Okay. So that's the, the pitch detection and, and where it goes. Uh, and then just these controls on the front page for oscillator pitch, it just goes to its own oscillator, right? Each of these leads back to a specific oscillator. And then there's a transpose control, which goes uh, to all three oscillators. Um, so that's, you know, the, the oscillator section. And the, the advantage there, and, and something you can do, right, is you can set up octaves and fifths and, and all of that sort of thing, right? You can detune them against one another. And this is, when we talk about synthesis, like one of the real advantages of using multiple oscillators is that actually um, the ways that they interfere with one another can, can change the timbre of, of what's happening too. So detuning is a good example of that, where the, the beating or the cycling of the two oscillators against one another creates a sound that is different from just like two pitches that are slightly detuned because they're interfering with each other. Uh, so anyhow, the other place coming out of this high pass filter that we go is our envelope follower. And the envelope follower goes into a sample and hold, and I'll come back to that in a second, uh, that then goes into a CV filter. And the settings of the CV filter are controlled by these attack and decay. And they're, they're attenuated. You can look into how much they're attenuated. They're attenuated a fair amount. I'm not going to go over every attenuation here. Um, and the CV filter then goes a few places. It goes to our VCA. You know, controlling uh, look at that. Because the attack and the looser set pretty. response. Um, the other place that, that that goes is actually into a multiplier, which goes to a filter, um, a low pass filter in this case, um, because this is based on a subtractive synthesis style. And the, the combination of, of this element, or, or what the filter really brings to the table is something that we didn't get to talk about. Uh, and I want to talk about a few options you have with filters. One is that this filter is also tracked to the pitch. I should say that's one other place that the pitch detector goes. And 
what this does is it means that there's a minimum that the filter will, a minimum frequency for the filter that will follow the pitch of the oscillators. And, and that means you get sort of a consistent baseline filter response as you move up and down the neck. If you didn't have that connection, as you played higher, uh, the, the, you know, the filter cutoff frequency is here. And as you play lower, 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 higher, same frequency, higher, 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 the filter would affect notes differently and they'd have a different like character to them as you play up and down. And that can be something you want in some cases. So the reason I'm pointing this out is that there's advantages to, to both. Um, but then the, the envelope also goes through a multiplier, which we're using as a depth control to the filter. And I didn't get to this part, but when you run an oscillator through a modulated filter, that's when you really start to get the sort of more synthy tones. Add some attack to this. And some resonance. So, uh, you know, the, the envelope, an envelope filter or an LFO driven filter or, or whatever, with the combination of oscillators really is when the, the sound starts to come alive. And that's the end of the synthesis part, uh, really. Then effects can have a pretty profound effect. Um, so this goes into a chorus and a reverb and a delay, and that's all part of the sound too. That's part of the sound design. Um, and there are uh, a lot of other ways to approach this. You can do FM with, with uh, you know, oscillators. And, and I do that. Uh, I'm working on a, a patch right now that, that uses that to sort of like thicken up a, like a bass synth sort of tone. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Rob asked earlier, and I, I don't know if Rob is still listening about like doing a drone synth um, and that, that only changed notes when you uh, pressed stop switch. I'll go back to the, the beginning of this. I have uh, this envelope follower going into a sample and hold, and that sample and hold is actually set to track and hold. And what it does is uh, what it does So I, I put that in there as a way to sort of sustain notes. But if I put that sample and hold after the pitch detector and uh, I took it off track and hold, I used it as a, a sample and hold, um, the same sort of thing could be used to only have the pitch detector be transmitted to the oscillators when I press the stomp switch. Now, I could be playing along and it would be detecting all of those pitches, but the, the sample and hold sort of acts as like a gatekeeper and only passes information when I would, you know, press on the stomp switch and it would hold that node until I pressed on the stomp switch again and again and again. Uh, or you could do a track and hold and instead of, you know, pressing on the stomp switch, you could have it track until you wanted to drone a note 
uh, and then hold that note with a, a you know, like if you use the latching stop switch so that um, I can just show off how to do this. Probably pretty quickly. He says, So all I've done here is I've put a uh, sample and hold. Um, a sample and hold is between my pitch detector now and that CV filter I was using for, for glide. Um, I'm playing different notes now, but you might not know it. Uh, but if I play a note, uh, I mean, put this on the right. If I play a note and press the right stomp switch. slightly differently. I could turn track and hold on. And now it's going to pass those notes. Or I'm actually going to send it to both my envelope and my, my pitch. So anyhow, sample and holds are, are the key to a bunch of stuff in Zoya, um, particularly when you want something to happen under a given condition, right? Um, a, like, you can use a sample and hold to sort of act as a buffer between um, when those conditions are, are met, if they're sort of periodic conditions. Uh, and the track and hold is is another opportunity to go from like real time monitoring, let's say, to something that is sample uh, and held until you want to return to real time monitoring. Um, and there's other stuff, but yeah, I, you know, I mean, again, it, it all sort of comes down to to nuance and subtlety and what you're going for and, you know, like different articulation schema. Like this is um, not the, the best synth that I would recommend for, for like, I really like synthetic baseline tone uh, because I have a synth called Melange that I think does that better. And the reason it does that better is because it uses triggered envelopes so you get a really consistent response out of it uh, when you when you play that sort of you know like percussive, consistent electronic bass sound. Um, this one is more for like leads and articulations, and all of those decisions go into uh, you know how you make a patch, right? Like what what you're doing. I'm going to bring Mike in uh, again. He's muted. He's muted himself, but we're going to bring him in and I'm going to get rid of this guy for just some final thoughts, final thoughts, closing questions. Um, yeah. Um, so maybe it's definitely recency bias, um, but we talked we talked about this during the last stream. Um, we talked about synth secrets, which I figured was finally a good indication for me to read the whole thing because I had cherry picked some articles in the past. I, I read the whole thing. 
it's 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 a lot of information. Yeah. Um. So it, it, it I'm not fully done. I I think I've done like 15 of the articles so far. Um. And it takes like 12 of them for him to get into like. I guess I should say real examples, but real examples. Uh, the first like 12 or, or 13 or so are setting the foundation for everything that synthesis is and, and synthesis does. Uh, so like thinking, so a good example would be, he mentions, I think it's in the first article, he talks about how uh, the Mini Moog, Mini Moog, sorry, Mini Moog Voyager is very different from an ARP 2000 or ARP Odyssey because the difference between gated and triggered envelopes, right? And you may not realize that initially you, you see, you know, this cool panel of faders versus the, you know, the, the classic mini Moog look and you're like, oh, they can, they look like they can do similar things. Um, but that one decision changes how you interact with the synthesis and the envelopes and everything. Um, so you can easily have both. <laughs> at that point. So he, he talks a lot about like looking into things like envelopes and articulation. And I think that's, you know, where a lot of what we talked about in this, in this stream um, highlights, you know, how different things are just from these subtle changes and how you affect CV and the envelopes and everything. So all those tools like the envelope follower, the CV filter, the slew limiter, you know, the different ways you can trigger uh, the VCA to open up either from an ADSR or from a you know, uh, an on-scent source or just the envelope itself uh, changes how much of the sound is going to be more so than just the raw source sometimes. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we, Mike and I have conversations outside of this live stream. And, and you know, like my, my position more and more as I do more and more synthesis, um, and I've expounded on uh this to mike is that like people pay way too much attention to shit like oscillators and filters um and you know oh blah blah, blah. like what really makes the sound of a synth to me at this point particularly uh, either one that i'm playing on guitar or that i'm playing via keys is the way in which it is articulated the the envelope um that affects that filter that opens that VCA that that influences the pitch of the oscillator you know there are a million different ways to route articulation but but those things are it's it's easy to overlook when you first start getting into synthesis or you know or pat you know I mean abyss water is a good example of a place where where that also matters again a lot but it's not necessarily synthesis per se, but it's definitely influenced, but you know, the low pass gate comes out of Hoopla and, and synthesis and that sort of thing. But I, that, that articulation stuff, it's real easy to, to breeze past it. Um, and I think like the more time I, I spend with synthesis, that's the place where I don't breeze like the other yeah. stuff is the stuff that's not terribly important, uh, you know. As uh, as fun as like FM is and and like weird synthesis and like wavetable stuff, you know, that's cool to make a cool sound. But if it's just going to be the same static sound over and over again, it's going to get boring no matter what. So you need you need unique ways to affect the envelopes and then the filters and stuff. And so that's where um, the articulation comes in. And, the other side of that is, is LFOs yeah. and, and automate like there's like these two competing things that work together, right? One is sort of an automated, um, you know, response, and the other is one that is very. Uh, why am I like agency? Like it, it it's deterministic. Um, oh right, right. So it's like. So one is just shit that happens, you know, like you have no free will. And then the other one is the place where human agency comes into play and you've decided to press a key or play a guitar string or, or whatever it might be. Um, and, and yeah, like if I want you to have any takeaway from this, it's that oscillators don't matter. You should never use, no, but, but like, 
that when you, you know, like the things that, that Mike and I both talked about a lot were taking these sort of basic elements, you know, the envelope follower, the, the you know, the uh, LFO, the, you know, and, and those subtle tweaks that, that take you from something, you know, that is, that take you into the realm of that thing that you, you want. Is, right. Yeah. It, 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 it's less about, especially for the LFO case, like uh, for the getting those random spaces between the the edges of the envelope may not seem like something that you should do, but it adds just enough variation where it doesn't sound, you know, static. Right. Yeah. So do we have any more questions or, can, or I, I'm, I'm done with my soap, soap box. Um, I think, I think we're good there. Um, thanks everybody. Um, this will be posted on YouTube probably within the hour. <laughs> Uh, check out the new firmware. Um, check out other cool stuff. The patches that we used are on patch storage, uh, or you could download them using the librarian. Uh, or any other things to plug? Uh, I I finished my loop hop submission, but I need to film my video. <laughs> I never got anywhere with my loop pop submission, which is a, a shame. But if you win another Zoya, you know, that'll just, that was the real reason I was going to enter. I thought I just need, I need one more. One more. <laughs> I'll let you know. But yeah, that should be coming out within probably over the weekend. I'll probably post yeah. it. Um, when does that end for anyone who else? I think it's right. Twenty fifth. So you've still got time, people, to beat Mike, steal his his prize right out of his hands. <laughs> apparently, they've gotten a lot of submissions. So yeah, yeah. I, I heard. I saw him saying he got like almost two hundred so far. Yeah. So we'll see. Really, the only the only good part of mine is the chorus. Everything else is kind of okay. But the chorus, I think, is really cool. <laughs> anyway. A lot of very long-lasting careers have been made on one good chorus. That's true. That is very true. Um, so, anyway. All right, guys. Uh, have a good evening. Uh, stay safe. All the jazz. We'll see you around. Take care, etc. And broadcast. Bye. Yes. Yeah.